For April 24th, 2020, I am Rick Richards, and this is COVID Crash 46, brought to you as always by Athletic Alliance. Yes, it is COVID Crash 46. Started off COVID Chronicles, moved to COVID Cast, now it's COVID Crash. Because I think I think the real story now is the crash, the crash of everything that is happening now. And man, I have been feeling it this week. You can see I'm getting a little sloppy. The hair is getting a little long, a little gray in the sides there. I'm a bit of a silver fox. Maybe that'll be my MO. Maybe I can travel around Europe <laughs> seducing widows. The silver fox, that'll be my nickname, right? But I'm gonna have to gonna have to pick up the uh, dress code, the sartorial um, appearance. You can see I'm wearing wearing the shirt that I wore a few days ago, and I know I know I have a lot of ladies in the audience. I know I have a high high proportion of female viewers. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm letting myself go. I'm losing track of the days. I'm losing track of the time. Losing track of uh, finance. It's all just slipping away, right? But we're gonna try to cheer you up. And I'm not the only one, I know that. And twice, twice in the last week, uh, on one of my few ventures outside to get gas or whatever it might be, I have seen grown men, adult grown men, walking in their pajamas. Now, I know the pajama, I don't know when the pajama trend started. Does anybody else know when this started? I mean, Ivan... <laughs> They, they have pajama day at school now, right? And never had it when I was a kid. When I was a kid, you wore your clothes. If you felt like being a slob, you threw on sweats, right? But now it's pajama day. Like, I, I don't know why that's a good idea. And I, I first started noticing it about 10 or 11 years ago. I noticed you'd see teenage girls kind of going out in the U.S. In the States, I'd see this happening in their pajamas. And I thought, mm, man, I, I'm not so sure about this. But, I mean, that's one thing. Now when you start to see middle-aged guys walking around in pajamas, like, holy shit, man make some effort. Okay. You know, I know, it, I know it's a lot of work peeling off the pajamas that you slept in all night and rolling up a pair of sweatpants or jeans and then tightening, fastening. Maybe they're just getting too tight, right? Maybe everybody's busting out of their jeans, but man, that's what Lululemon is for, right? You can still slide on a pair of those, but it seems to be too much effort for some people. It seems to be, we are uh, regressing in a, into a, a slovenly state. Oh man, I just realized I didn't make any notes for the show, so I'm going to have to wing it. Welcome to the show. Like I said, COVID crash 46 for April 24th, 2020. Brought to you, of course, by Athletic Alliance. Let's do some shout outs. Shout out to Jackson, Roy Ann, and the rest of Davyton, Dwayne, Charlene, Cassidy, my boy Ivan, my assistant from Sector B49. Ivan's there for the high five, right, Ivan? Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Ivan, Ivan keeps it low key. He doesn't, doesn't crank up the excitement and the energy like I do. I bring it, man. Shout out to Gymnasium, Terry McLean, producer Dave, Odell. Uh, I don't think Kim watches anymore, so I might, I might drop you from the shout out list, Kim. Special friend of the show, Lisa, still on there for now, Lisa. You're on probation, though. I'm watching. I am watching. Special friend Julia, Angie, and yeah, that probably does it. That probably does it, right? So what is happening in the world today? Well, let's take a look. Let's take a look first at the COVID, the never-ending COVID situation. Just goes on and on and on. I'm at, what am I at now? COVID-46, right? So... I mean, originally I had planned on doing two weeks of this. It's just starting six weeks. Right? Yeah, this we're in six weeks now, right? Yeah. Six weeks from notification that the whole lockdown thing was going on, and five weeks since I five and a half weeks since I started doing this broadcast of sorts, right? It is kind of growing weary on me, but I will keep it up for now. So worldwide, we have two million eight hundred twenty thousand. Corona cases, 196,000 deaths, close to 800,000 recovered. This graph looks the same no matter what happens. This graph just seems to go straight up. And I mean, I'm not quite sure. I'm going to dig into these one of these days. And Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah, 
So we had a bit of a flattening and we're having another flattening it looks like right now. Let's move down and see who has been hit the hardest. The USA, of course, is coming up on a million cases. And in all reality, I think it's way, way, way more than that. News has come out from California that um, something like 30% of the population um, have already had it, have already had the coronavirus. And I have said that is a good result. And people are like, why is that a good result? And well, that means that it's already moved through the population. The majority of people have gotten this and don't even realize it and had no ill effects from it, right? Man, this Havoc 137 is really, really damn good. Strawberry lemon. I'm glad I kicked a monster to the curb. So the US, uh, 51,000 deaths, almost 52,000 now, 1,600 last night. So yeah, the curve is flattening. I mean, there's any way you look at it, things are kind of slowing down, right? The UK, uh, still, still moving up, slowed down there as well. Um, you know, they'll probably end up with maybe 30,000 deaths when all this is over. The US may have around 75 to 80,000, which would put it ahead of the strongest flu season, which was two years ago. So maybe that's kind of the new normal. Maybe we're going to see this kind of stuff every couple of years. Whether we know, whether we need to shut down the economy, I mean, that's a different story, right? Uh, France looks like things have kind of subsided quite a bit there. Italy, still quite a few deaths, to be honest, but I mean, it, way down from their peak. Spain, well down from their peak as well. What else do we got here? Sweden, which has done very few lockdown measures, if any at all, mostly just recommendations. Uh, even them, their, their death rate is slowing down. And the slowing of the death rate typically follows the slowing of the infection rate or the serious infection rate. I mean, we really don't know the actual infection rate. This is a case of the more people are tested, the more cases you find, right? So cases is really not something, I think, um, that tells you a lot of information. I think more it's a case of serious or critical cases that are the numbers we should be watching. So our neck of the woods, Canada. What is happening in Canada? All right. British Columbia, 1,824 confirmed cases, 94 deaths. <laughs> Sorry, guys, that's not a lot for a province with four you know, over four. What's the population of BC? It's like either 4.2 or 4.4 million. Pull it up, Ivan. Ivan, pull up the population of BC and Alberta. Let's find out what we're, what we're looking at here. Population of BC is five, over 5 million. Just over five okay, million. so over 5 million. And, uh, and Alberta, 4.3 million. 4.3, okay. So we're looking at almost 10 million people, right? Almost 10 million and 164 deaths. I got to tell you, man, that's, that's not a lot, right? That's not a lot. So just for the measures that have been in place, I mean, obviously it's worse in Ontario. It's been moving through the old folks' homes, the long care homes there, and Quebec in particular. Quebec has really become the epicenter. Um, you know, it, it's kind of strange considering that it, it arrived in BC first and it arrived from overseas in BC. But, you know, I think when you see these numbers, I think this is more indicative of the measures that have taken place in, um, in the long-term care homes. And I think instead of, see, we're in this situation now where we have thrown so much money in so many different directions, and it's not going to make a huge difference, whereas we could have thrown way less money into just securing these um, long-term, old folks' homes, securing old folks' homes and um, just bringing in extra workers, quarantining healthcare workers that were visiting them, quarantining the homes themselves. You could have pushed a lot more resources into those homes and saved a lot of money and kept everything more or less normal, right? So overall in Canada, 43,550 people um, technically have the virus or have tested positive for the virus. 2,200, just under 2,300 have perished as a result. What else in Canada? Um, let's see. Canada is flattening the coronavirus curve. That's good news. 
expert explains. Oh, good. So we have an expert to come out and tell us that that's good news. Expert. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Expert. Yeah, thank you. Air quotes expert, right? And you know what? I, I, okay, man, calm down, everybody. I know there's experts out there. I know there's people that, you know, work on this stuff all the time. But let's be honest. I mean, the experts have been all over the place, right? But let's see what they're saying here. Canada is flattening the coronavirus curve. That's good news, experts explain. I don't know why that's necessary to say that's good news. Like, are we that goddamn stupid? That Is that good news or is that bad news? No. Well, if, if you're in the mask selling industry, I suppose it might be bad news or the plexiglass industry. Canadians have closed schools and shut down large parts of the economy to deal with the threat of the novel coronavirus. Encouragingly, public health experts say that a graph of positive tests shows that the sacrifice is working. Well, this is a good news graph, said Stephen Hoffman of York University. How successfully are provinces flattening the curve? The graph shows the growth trend of confirmed cases in each province since reaching its 100th confirmed case. Each province below reached this grim milestone at a different point in time. By placing these curves over one another, we can compare how successfully each province is combating the outbreak. All right, so I mean, wasn't that the point of the, um, the whole point of this lockdown was to flatten the curve, right? It was to flatten the curve so that the health services would not be overwhelmed, right? I mean, I may have selective memory, but I'm pretty sure that I go back and watch some of the shows, I suppose, right? I'm pretty sure that that's um, indeed what the, what the purpose and the objective of all this was, to flatten the curve, right? And we can see that the curve has been flattened in BC for quite some time, right? Quite some time, I mean, at least close to a month it's been flattened, right? Uh, Alberta looks like it's, yeah, it's more or less flat. I mean, it's flattened a bit, then it's creeping up a bit. But I mean, these are cases again too, right? I mean, fatalities are a better indicator because, you know, people can be asymptomatic or they can have minor symptoms and the more testing, as long as if you're testing more people, the curve is not going to flatten. The curve is going to more or less keep going, right? So, okay. Uh, if Canada's coronavirus lockdown eases, could sewage act as an early warning system? And here we do see that there's a lot of scare tactics that say, we got to keep doing this, right? And their projections and more of that, right? So... What are we looking at? What are we looking at in terms of everything that's gone on? Well, the world is definitely becoming a madhouse. A madhouse, yes. Well put, Ivan. It's definitely becoming a madhouse. And the reaction is really, really over the top. Uh, let's take a look at some of the stuff we are seeing right now. So, Many of you, I know, are familiar with uh, Donald Trump. I know he um, has some people that take quite an interest in him. Some people don't like him so much. Some people are, are not big fans of Donald Trump. And I can't say that I'm a big fan of Donald Trump, but I do try to be somewhat objective in uh, judging him. And anyways, Donald Trump has come out and said, a dash of soap bubbles, two pinches of sunshine, and just a drop of imagination. That's how uh, pouring all those ingredients into a fizzy, conco fizzy concoction is how to deal with the coronavirus. So basically, you want to get disinfectant. Um, you want to get a couple pinches of sunshine, soap, and some imagination. Pour them all into a big pot, and I suppose either inject it or drink it down. And of course, this is obviously a spoof headline from The Onion. But... I have heard many people say that people were saying Donald Trump says you should inject, uh, you should inject, um, sunshine. not sunshine, Ivan, Ivan's, Ivan's messing with my head. You should inject disinfectant and uh, light can kill the virus, right? And I, and I watched, uh, oh, stop messaging me now, for God's sakes, man. I watched um, the press conference. That's not, not quite what he said. He sort of, implied that that would be an effective way to deal with it. Uh, hold on, Microsoft Teams, get away from me. Leave me alone, okay? Anyways, 
<clears throat> so I think people kind of took that and ran with it. And it's just, you know what, if you're the person, if you're a person out there and you think you heard someone say inject disinfectant and that will cure you, something else is probably going to get you anyways. If it ain't the coronavirus, you, you're just, you're kind of dumb and you probably won't make it too much farther. If you're, if you're a person that's going to go out, buy a hypodermic needle, fill it up with cleaning fluid and go, all right, Donald Trump says it works. Ah! You know, man, you really, you don't need keys to a car. That's for sure. But anyways, moving on to other more serious stuff. Another headline, emotional burden of coronavirus on British Columbians has been significant. You think? Really? You think so? I tell you, man, if I have one more night spent of uploading, scanning, homework, and schoolwork, I am going to lose my mind, okay? A BC residents stay home, as, as BC residents stay home and observe physical distancing, you notice they've tried to... Um, They've tried to rebrand social distancing as physical distancing. They're, they're always trying to mess with words, right? Physical distancing. That way we can still be social through Zoom and Skype, right? No, it's distancing, right? Uh, as they observe physical distancing due to the ongoing novel coronavirus outbreak, a new poll has found the emotional burden due to the changes brought on by the pandemic has been significant. Yeah, I guess it would be, right? I guess going bankrupt is kind of significant too. That would certainly bum some people out, wouldn't it? The poll conducted by Insights West looked at how British Columbians were coping during this unique time and found most are experiencing high levels of worry, stress, boredom, anxiety, and loneliness compared to before the pandemic. All you got to do is sit on your couch, man. Oh, yeah, okay. All right, slackers, we tried it your way, and guess what? A lot of us don't like it. Okay, 30% of parents polled said they feel their relationship with their children is better, while only 8% said it's worse. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. You know what? I mean, it, it depends on, <laughs> I gotta watch what I say, Ivan's. Ivan's close by, but I guess it depends on what you're doing with them, right? It depends on what you're doing. The homework certainly is stressful. Uh, about 28% of those in a spouse or partner relationship say this crisis had made their relationship better versus only 14% who says it's made it worse. Well, where's the negative news here then? They're saying this is an emotional burden and yet they're saying everybody likes, loves their kids more. They love their spouse more. I have some questions on that too. I have some questions on that too. I, I think being locked in quarantine doesn't exactly, uh, <laughs> doesn't exactly improve how everybody gets along, does it? Uh, however, work relationships may not be positively impacted. The proportion whose relationship with their coworkers are better, 18%, is nearly equal to those whose relationships are worse, 14%. But still, there's 18% say their work relationship is better. Hmm. That's weird because more people are working at home. So anyways, they, they present all this news as though this is a good thing. Uh, but then they say the emotional burden on individuals in our province has been dramatic. Well, why? Why would it be dramatic if it's improved all your relationships? I guess, I guess dramatic means it's dramatically improved, right? Uh, to, 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 to see one quarter of the population not coping well and the majority of us feeling more stress, anxiety, and worry shows that this pandemic has impacted us far beyond the physical and financial level. Isn't the physical and financial level enough? Like, man, I, <clears throat> I live by a beach and there's a, it's kind of a remote access to the beach and there's stairs that go down to the beach. The stairs are locked now because it's not safe. We can't walk down to the goddamn beach because we might die or we might get somebody infected. Well, you know what, man? If you're so old and you've got underlying conditions that make you very vulnerable, you stay away from the beach, okay? Let the rest of us go. You stay inside for your own good, okay? Maybe that sounds harsh, but it's being done to the rest of us, okay? Uh, the poll finds that despite the fact that the majority of British Columbians are coping well, there is a significant number who are hurting. The majority of residents polled rate the job they are doing in coping with the COVID-19 situation on emotional or personal level as good or excellent, blah, 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 blah. So you know what? I think this, this by and large depends on um, your situation. Like it's got to be really tough if you have four or five of you living in an apartment, man, that's got to be tough. Or if you live with somebody who has um, addictions like alcohol or drug addictions, that has to be very tough. 
somebody with anger issues, that's got to be tough. If you have someone like my, my old gray haired daddy, a gambling addict, oh man, that's not easy. That is not easy. I see him all the time. The other day he was trying to bet on, we had, we had two uh, spiders walking toward walking on the path and and he wanted to bet on which one was going to win the race i'm like man you can't bet on something with eight legs eight legs don't doesn't go in a straight line they zigzag they go off the path they're spiders they might stop altogether that's not a good bet anyways he wanted to make that bet happen but i stopped it so what else do we got here what else this is from zero hedge the data is in stop the panic and end the total isolation the data is in. We needed data to know that, right? The tragedy of the COVID-19 pandemic appears to be entering the containment phase. Tens of thousands of Americans have died, and Americans are now desperate for sensible policymakers who have the courage to ignore the panic and rely on facts. Leaders must examine accumulated data to see what has actually happened, rather than keep emphasizing hypothetical projections Combine that empirical evidence with fundamental principles of biology established for decades and then thoughtfully restore the country to function. So five key facts are being ignored. Let's see what they are. Because we are a show laced with opinion, of course, but heavily reliant on facts. That's what I like. I like facts. If you're a strategist, you have to plan and you have to prepare and you have to mitigate, right? Model, as they like to say. And to do that, you have to have reliable statistical information. Fact number one, the overwhelming majority of people do not have any significant risk of dying from COVID-19. Thank you. I have been saying that for over a month now. You want an expert? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not an expert, but um, not only the overwhelming majority of people do not have any significant risk of dying, but people under 25 have almost no risk of dying. They are more likely to be killed by a coconut falling off a tree, right, Ivan? Yeah. Yeah. Ivan's made that apparently clear to me that dying from a coconut banging on your head. First of all, if a coconut falling on your head kills you, like fuck, man, how thin is your skull, dude? There's more deaths from uh, coconut not like hitting you on the head than shark attacks. Yeah. Well, yeah. shark attack. Okay, man, that's also another thing, right? Uh, fact number two. Protecting older at-risk people eliminates hospital overcrowding. Hey, hey, you guys heard that from me too, right? See, that's why you watch this, this COVID crash. That's I was going to say broadcast, but is it really a broadcast or is it just a, a rambling YouTube video? But hey, I come up with these things first, right? Ah, fact number three, vital population immunity is prevented by total isolation policies prolonging the problem. Yes, that is another thing. So what we should have done is we should have isolated the people that were the most vulnerable first because they're not gonna develop immunity. They're always gonna be somewhat vulnerable. But if you, if you isolate them first, the rest of us will develop a herd immunity and this thing will eventually fade or die out, right? Fact number four. People are dying because other medical care is not getting done due to hypothetical projections. And I said this just the other day, didn't I? I said, how many people um, are going to not get diagnosed with, for cancer or um, are going to put off getting checked out for some medical procedure just because things are being extended or they don't want to go to hospitals? Not only that, but when these things do open up, we're gonna be faced with an overcrowding situation again, right? Um, fact number five, we have a clearly defined population at risk who can be protected with targeted measures. Yes, I've said this as well. So you know what, man, I was onto all this shit pretty early on and I still am. I still think this would be the sensible approach right now. Keep social isolation in place. Keep social isolation in place protect the vulnerable populations, um, schools, sports, community sports, all that stuff should be opened up. Sorry, Ivan. I know you don't want the schools, but hey, you get the sports, right? Open up all that stuff. Start off restaurant with limited seating capacity just to make yourselves feel better. And then you can roll out to something a little more complex and advanced. And you better start doing it fast, right? You better start doing it fast because I mean, the way I see it, we are clearly 
probably past the peak now, right? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, and so measures should be in place now, right, to deal with this stuff. But this is not what we're seeing. This is not what we are seeing. A punch in the gut, 2020 Calgary Stampede canceled due to COVID-19. Now, canceling something in April that takes place in July, hmm, I mean, there's over two months before this even kicks off. More than two months before the stampede even starts, and they're canceling it now. Wait, how long is stampede? Oh, it goes for about nine days, ten days. Starts in July, starts a couple days into July, goes for about nine or ten days. Same thing as calling off the Olympics, right? <clears throat> uh, so the mayor came out and he said, this one's tough. I remember standing at the podium seven years ago and talking about how even though we only had two weeks, come hell or high water, Calgary Stampede would go on. And yeah, there's been a lot of difficult things. I remember one year there was uh, extreme flooding in Calgary and over a hundred years. So even during World War II, this still went on, right? But this has been canceled. And this is in Alberta. In Alberta, they have had some issues at uh, food processing plants, but by and large, very little effect in Alberta as a whole. I think, what was it, 65 or so cases or 65, 70 fatalities. So we're seeing that, right? We're seeing these extreme measures. And yet, yet, while the U.S. has banned immigration to Canada, or banned immigration, Canada welcomes them. So Trump, a lot of people got on Trump's case um, for a lot of things, but people seem to be commending him for an executive order that temporarily suspends immigration, but not in Canada. Not in Canada. Uh, Canada will not be adopting any similar immigration suspension, according to Radio Canada report. Despite the havoc coronavirus has wreaked on the global economy, Canada still recognizes that immigration supports the labor market. What labor market? Like, what are you guys doing? This, oh, man. This is just, it, it just, it seems almost beyond stupidity to the point that it's deliberately, it's deliberately uh, nasty, right? Canada's per capita immigration intake is triple that of the United States. Canada welcomes three times as many immigrants on a per capita basis than the U.S., um, and this is going on as always, as it has been. Um, and I just thought that was, you know what? I, I thought, I thought that was just something to make you guys aware of because we get a lot of people that are yelling at somebody for gathering in a parking lot, right? People are really, really upset when you see three people and you want to call the police or you want to call the tip line on them, right? That really, really pisses people off, but somehow this doesn't. Somehow this doesn't. So if you're gonna bitch about Trump or whoever else, think about what's going on in our country because there is a lot of stupidity, right? A lot of stupidity still going on. And this brings me to a few of the things I've heard. So um, this is something that I actually covered earlier on. Canada to allow seasonal foreign workers, but they must self-isolate. So we are going to be allowing, um, I think something like 60,000 seasonal workers to come in and do fishing and farm work, right? And I think most people uh, recognize that that is important. We want that to be done, right? They are gonna self-isolate, which um, we know is not gonna happen, right? We know that's not gonna happen. You know, people coming in, uh, they're not going to self-isolate. It's impractical for them to do it. Where are they going to do it? Who's going to pay for them to do it, right? And once they get to um, these places, then, you know, what difference does it make, right? But one thing I, I find really strange is that there seems to be this perception that we have to bring foreign people in to do farm work. And I'm not sure why that is. Why, why is it impossible? I myself have actually worked on a farm. And it's one of the most unpleasant farms you could work on. I worked on a mushroom farm. Mm. Yeah. Was it, was it fun work? No, it was shitty. But whatever. It was a job and I needed a job and I was 19. So you know what? The, the fact that people that are unemployed right now uh, won't take work at a farm. Well, that's too bad, man. That's too bad. You know, you want money. 
and there's a job available on a farm and you are able-bodied, you should be out there doing it, right? Especially if you are young and fit. And I thought this was quite interesting. Um, this is on CBC. Um, this journalist laughs at a student who says he wants to work on a farm. So I thought this was kind of, kind of strange that this student, this nice young guy, he steps up and he actually wants to work on a farm and she laughs when he does it. Let's have a listen. You would uh, see yourself doing in terms of volunteer work or, or one of the, the jobs that the Prime Minister was talking about? Honestly, uh, farming sounds quite uh, interesting. I <laughs> do have a background in athletics, so I'm, I'm not averse to rolling up the sleeves and getting out there and doing whatever I can to support both Canadians, fellow Canadians, and then also myself. Yeah, good on him. Look at this guy, this young guy, man. He wants to get out. He doesn't mind doing some work. He doesn't mind going out to farms. We need people like this, right? This, this is a guy that's a hero, you know? He'll go out, he'll do hard work. So don't give me this bullshit that nobody in Canada can work on a farm. Like it's like we're, we're these hot house little flowers that can't get our precious piano playing fingers dirty. Lots of people can do it and lots of people will do it. And lots of people are happy to do it and they can earn money. You know what? They can, they can earn money towards a college tuition. They can keep fit. Like, I mean, does everybody have to sit on their ass while they work? So anyways, I mean, I thought that was, I thought that was a little bit, really condescending that the reporter would laugh he says he wants to work on a farm and she laughs i guess the idea to her is just so absurd that she can't imagine anybody willingly working on a farm and i thought this was funny this really made me howl uh this guy safe to say he is not a fan of the lockdown fucking trudeau say i have to sit at home and not work you think indian people are not gonna fucking work how about my son? He eat and shit every day. Who's going to pay for that shit? We are open. Okay, fucking guy? We are open. Come. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love this guy. I wish I knew who he was. We are fucking open. Hear that fucking guy? <laughs> yeah, good for him. Because you know what? The government does not have a right to shut down your businesses. If we want to do this voluntarily and everybody is on board and says, hey, uh, let's try this. Let's see if this stops the problem. Let's protect people. Okay. But there comes a point where you can't just force people out of business. Okay. And this guy, a lot of people will give him shit, will give me shit. But I love it, man. I love it that this guy wants to work, right? And he, he resents being told that he can't. So I am going to end on that amusing note. I know it'll piss some of you off. Hey, that's okay. Be angry at me. Be angry at me. Be angry at the government. But don't be angry at people out walking, okay, that want to get some sunlight, okay? Don't be angry at them. Remember, I know we're all on Team Canada or Team America or Team World or whatever, but let's try to stick together, right? Let's try to stick together because believe me, what is washing over us now is much worse than the virus. We have the economic tsunami, the social unrest, a lot of stuff coming, guys. And we are going to have to work hard to deal with it. And the sooner we start, the better. Okay? So, for Ivan, I am Rick Richards. And we will see you on the COVID cast tomorrow.